Hi everyone and welcome to Playtime Online. This is the Institute of Play's webinar series that allows us to connect and share our work with you. My name is Nancy Novacek. Today we'll be looking at participatory culture as a context and framework for situating games and art projects. We hope to see how these fields inform one another and what can be learned from working with games, working with games and the public in an institutional context. If at any point you'd like to ask today's speakers a question, just click on the blue participate text under this video on the right hand side. We'll be spending the last few minutes or so of the webinar answering questions during our Q&A portion. Today's participants in uh, today's playtime are Ted Pervez. Ted Pervez is a writer and artist based in Oakland, California. His public projects and writings are centered on investigating the practice of art in the world. He was founder of the MFA Concentration in Social Practice at California College of Arts in 2005 and is currently the chair of the MFA Fine Arts Program. Ted and Shane Aslan Selzer are co-authors of What We Want is Free, Critical Exchanges in Recent Art in, that will be published by SUNY Press in early 2014. Our next participant, Shane Aslan Selzer, is an artist whose practice develops micro-communities where artists can expand on larger social issues such as generosity, exchange, and failure. Sheetal Prajapati is an associate educator in the public programs at the Museum of Modern Art. Last year, she organized a two-day conference exploring how artists are employing games as a framework for engagement, inspiration, and social change in their work. Since then, Sheetal has been working to develop other kinds of participatory experiences through long-term artist collaborations at MoMA. Pedro Reyes is a Mexican artist. He uses sculpture, architecture, video, performance, and participation. His work aims to increase individual or collective agency in social, environmental, and educational situations. Last but not least, Eric Zimmerman is a 20-year veteran of the game industry who creates games on and off the computer. Some of his recent game installations have been shown at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, in Berlin, Paris, and Dublin. Eric is also a professor at the NYU Game Center. Today's conversation is an exploration of the tiny tip of a very large iceberg. The correspondence between participatory art practice and games is something Ted and Shane and I have been talking about for the past several months. We've each been involved in public engagement in differing ways and have each noted more and more moments of crossover between our own work, the work of our other colleagues in the field, and games. We've also been noticing, alongside other forms of participatory projects, an increasing amount of games appearing in cultural institutions, such as museums. It's far too large to fully explore in this hour of playtime, nor is this a topic from which succinct outcomes can be drawn just yet. We're excited to start thinking about these ideas, though, and to be joined by Eric, Pedro, and Sheetal. I was hoping, uh, Ted, you could start us out by giving some context for this conversation. Sure. Thanks, Nancy. So we're here inhabiting a world of creative cultural production, which, which includes things called art and things called games. From one perspective, there's a large area of overlap. Both of these things, after all, have creators or authors or designers. Both have complex histories that involve philosophy, aesthetics, social investigation. Both forms critically explore the potentials of narrative. Both can explore conceptual ideas of ontology. And both of these forms use and utilize aesthetic design strategies which bring people or audiences into relationship with the artwork or game. These are the creative and authorial contexts that lead game designers and artists to strive in similar directions. Coincident with this, there's also been a rise in institutional support, both from the art world and through the growing critical study of games, to create more experimental and hybrid platforms for these two forms to be seen in an increasingly interrelated way. However, from another perspective, games and artworks are fundamentally different and produce different effects within the world. This is not seen within the context of their creation and their design, but more is evident in the patterns of their use. Simply put, audiences for games and art not only use them differently, but they structurally inhabit or own them differently. Games have players. People who frequently, dedicatedly, and or seriously play games become, or perhaps already are, or always were, gamers. Gamers, in many cases, especially more so with the internet and sort of the advent of fan cultures, are able to have impactful relationships on the world of games without becoming professionals within the world of game production. On the other hand, art has viewers. 
And while people who are seriously involved in viewing art can, in certain circumstances, become more deeply involved in the world of art production, most of these roots of involvement are ultimately professional, i.e. they can start to work within the institutional art world, or they can go to get an MFA or a BFA in art and learn and perhaps try to become a professional artist themselves. These stakes might also, or roots of involvement, might also be financial. They can become art collectors and own artworks. But unlike gamers, there are no arters. Someone, a fan or enthusiast perhaps, who uses art in an active or participatory way. Now just because there's no such thing as an arter does not mean that there's no real interest in discovering that such a person or role might exist. One of the most notable trends within the institutional art world, its museums and biennials, for example, is a steady increase in programming art projects and artist-led events that attempt to more wholly and dynamically involve art viewers to bring them into the frame, so to speak. This is more complex and complete than earlier attempts to dissolve viewers and audiences through things like the elimination of the fourth wall in theater, which simply sought to transform the passive spectator into an active viewer. So one of the key words in this trend has become the word participation and participant, a word which describes an interesting subcategory of audience, a semi-empowered viewer, one who has the power to decide to participate and who actively supplies specific content to a project. Even if ultimately they only fulfill a subscribed role within the work itself, there is a degree of agency within the role of participant. The dynamics and politics of participation, then, have become quite important ones within the art world. I believe that, is this, that it is this interest in participation that is one of the forces that's leading institutional art world to more seriously consider games as both viable artworks in and of themselves, but also as strategic forms for both modeling and generating participation. The dynamics of this interest are probably too broad for full consideration within one hour panel, as Nancy's already intimated. There's just a great deal too much to say about it. Just this morning I read a particularly interesting piece by the game designer and conceptual artist Zach Gage, which explored the aversion to considering play as an aesthetic term that might have similar gravity, such as would be found in a term like beauty, or criticality, or narrative. Before we move on to the panel, I wanted to add from my own perspective, both as a writer who thinks about the economy of participation within the art world, as well as that of a long-term gamer with over 40 years of life experience playing everything from chess to Dungeons and Dragons to Warhammer to Carcassonne, that these questions are persistent because they are difficult to answer. Both designers, artists, and the institutions that support them are often, in the framework of philosopher Michel de Citeau, strategic thinkers interested in creating structures that steer situations and people towards desired ends. Ultimately, in de Certeau's construction, the strategic creator approaches the task from a position of power. Audiences, if they are to have any power at all, are tactical thinkers. And most gamers that I've met over the years exemplify this position, responding to the stratagems that they inhabit forever, trying to work within a given framework and derive a temporary or ongoing sense of meaning and satisfaction with what they're given. How we bring together not just these forces, but also these roles is at the heart of the questions today. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to the panel to take on their own individual perspectives within this. Great. Thanks, Ted. Um, exactly. Eric, Pedro, and Sheetal, you are actually three artists, game designers, and educators who have been participating in this in this cultural context that Ted just identified. I, I was hoping that each of you could talk about a game project created for an institutional context um, and the expectations around it. What kind of participation of play was expected from the audience? Did they do what was expected? Were there any other ex unexpected outcomes? Eric, if you could start us, that would be great. Uh, sure. Uh, hi, everybody, and I'm so happy to be part of this panel. Um, although I come from the commercial games industry, I've been working for the last few years with an architect making games for an art context, for museums and galleries and festivals, which in some way has returned for me to the art world since I was originally trained as an artist. I thought I would share one of those projects today, a project called Interference. Um, which hopefully is appearing on all of your screens right now. Um, Interference is a project that I created with architect Natalie Pozzi, like I said. And it is a room-sized um, installation originally created for La Gaieté Lyrique in Paris last summer, summer 2012. 
as part of an exhibition called uh, Play Along. Interference is a game that uh, is for two players, and it is a small strategy game that you play by moving these little wooden blocks uh, around these hanging steel walls. Now, the steel walls are less than a millimeter thick, so they're extremely thin, and they're transparent, so you can see your partner slash opponent and all of the other players in this space as well. Um, you and your partner, this is actually a photo of, of Natalie, my collaborator, and I in this space. Uh, you and your partner play in a very local area on one wall, but, and you're playing a tiny strategy game, a small strategy game, where you're just trying to have more of your color, either red or white, than your opponent in that local area. Um, the twist to the game is that every turn, you actually take a piece from another pair of players' game. So you walk away from your game, you reach over into someone else's game, take a piece from them, and put it in your game. So the simple strategy game is made more complex by the fact that you're stealing from other players, and meanwhile, they're stealing from you. And so what would otherwise be a fairly straightforward strategy game becomes an exercise in chaos, frustration, then negotiation and metagaming as you realize that you have to work with and across all of these other games taking place in order to win your game. Um, in terms of Nancy's question, how interference was received and, and, uh, and the kind of experiential context around it, um, interference uh, in many ways uh, really is at the intersection of games and art in a sense that it is designed for a museum and gallery context, but it's very much a game. And I think that presented a lot of interesting challenges um, for us, uh, for the project. So, for example, um, it's very difficult to have people read a set of rules and learn those rules. And, uh, you know, no one comes to a museum or gallery wanting to to kind of learn learn a set of rules and play a game, and uh, especially when there's you know other artworks that one can engage with passively, or when there are um, uh, video games or things that you might play. In this case, there were other digital games on exhibit. So a lot of it is contending with uh, people's expectations about interactivity in this context. It was also challenging because interference really breaks on some of the rules of games in a sense that you don't normally interfere with another player's game. If you and I are playing chess, we don't expect someone else to reach up behind us, take one of our pieces and put it into their game. Um, so because of the fact that we're trying to do unconventional things with games and play and experience, um, that also was, uh, was interesting for us to contend with. But overall, I think that uh, interference um, you know, was a beautiful object that, uh, that uh, I can't take credit for, that my architect partner, Natalie Pozzi, designed. And we just wanted it to exist on many levels. So it's an aesthetic object that's sort of a beautiful, shimmering uh, sculpture in a space. It's also an interesting object if you decide to interact with it and play a game. And we had many people interacting with it in ways that weren't necessarily prescribed, whether it was little kids that were kind of moving and sorting the pieces as they wanted to, um, and also for an exhibition coming up in Los Angeles uh, this coming fall, we are going to be working with other game designers who are going to create their own uh, mods of interference. In other words, they're going to create their own set of rules for playing new games using the same hardware and set of pieces. So in a sense, interference, the sculpture becomes the operating system or deck of cards, and they'll be writing new rules for it. I think that's an interesting, unique thing about games, that they're sort of modifiable, uh, perhaps in ways that we don't normally think about art. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's a good little overview of interference. Maybe we'll come back to it. Um, well, I think it's um, uh, my turn after Eric. Thanks so much. Um, what I'm gonna uh, share with you now, it's a, a space where there's a different games. The, the, the exhibition goes by the name of Melodrama and other games. And it's basically a set of posters that I actually have some here right now. That, for instance, 
uh, they come as, as posters that you can take in exchange for playing a game. This one is called Mirroring. And uh, as you probably can see, there's like a set of uh, instructions which are mirrored, like creating a calligraphic, uh, almost Rorschach uh, test shape. But that's only the score or the instruction for a very simple game that I will try to play with you. If you uh, play with me, let's say that you hold a hand. Will everyone hold a hand? OK, let's see, because uh, let's, let's, let's just like, you're going to follow what I do. The, the, when, when you're playing this game, you have a partner in front of you. And you know, like, uh, if, you, if you hold your head and you uh, knock your head ag against the, the edge of the screen, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, we are now pressing, like, disappearing from the screen. And now, let's say that we are, like, turning around. And then we, someone else, takes the lead. Let's say, Nancy, why don't you take the lead now and we imitate you? Do Just do anything. <laughs> well, that's, that's very good. I think that you get the idea. This is just like a kind of a, a spontaneous activity that happens when you have a very simple instruction that technically doesn't need much more than the idea. And what I was interested in was in doing these uh, very simple games that uh, perhaps you learn in the, in the space, but then you incorporate and you can reactivate any time that you are perhaps sharing uh, some time in a waiting room and instead of each person going into his mobile phone you get you have a little thing to play Be because that's what the what games used to were invented for uh, just to kill time uh, a little bit but the idea of I, I may show you uh, now some pictures of how does this space looks when uh, is uh, when when they are uh, in the space. For instance, I, I just want to make sure that I am that is working. Uh, yes. Okay. Let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is, for instance, the space. The posters cannot be sold uh, uh, and cannot be bought. But you can, and you cannot take them um, for free. You have to somehow play a game in order to get them as a gift. And they also work as a wallpaper to define the playhouse or the play space. And uh, some are board games. For instance, uh, this one is called Melodrama. That is a kind of a, a iteration of uh, snakes and ladders, but with the ups and downs of a romantic relationship. Uh, this one is called Boom, which where, which is a game where you have a balloon that. Oh, okay. Pedro, I'm so sorry. We can't actually see your screen right now. We can't see the images. It's Thanks okay. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, no problem. So I'm start. Okay, I'm gonna stop screen share. And I'm going to, uh, yeah, OK. Now I chose this one. How about there? OK. So in this one, you have uh, Boom is a balloon that you have to uh, pop by sheer pressure between two bodies. Or there are others that are uh, like just old parlor games that you like this one where you blow a feather uh, in a sheet and or this one that is called pillow fight and you're suddenly uh, you suddenly find yourself in a very physical activity with total strangers 
letting out all these hila hilarious uh, uh, expressions of of joy and uh, and 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 madness. Uh, or, for instance, this one, which is called El Pelele. This is an old uh, Spanish uh, game. There's a famous painting by Goya that perhaps you remember. It's basically a dummy that is made out of uh, second-hand clothes and that you toss in the air uh, with a blanket. And it's just very silly and, 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 and uh, playing uh, like game to play. So these props are available in the space. And what you do is that you take the props, play a game, and in exchange you get the poster. And uh, what I was interested in is in somehow two things. One is uh, group dynamics that are created between strangers that are you know like a, that that get together for five minutes to 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 play the game because you need partners. So if you come alone and you're missing one person, you ask a stranger. And I'm interested in, cre in creating those encounters. And the second is also uh, sourcing out many of these ideas from the universe of street games that have disappeared from our world because now first was the arrival of the car and then the street ceased to, see, see, to be a social space and became uh, owned by the car. Then it was television, and finally computers and mobile devices uh, have become uh, so omnipresent that most of our interactions are mediated by technology. So I'm interested in creating spaces where there's no mediation by technology. By technology. So that's kind of uh, what the spirit of the project is. Fantastic. Thanks, Pedro. Shidol, I wonder if you could talk about a project that you've been working on at MoMA. Sure. So thank you very much, Nancy. And it's um, a pleasure to be on this panel with uh, really creative thinkers. Um, so uh, as Nancy mentioned, I work at the Museum of Modern Art. And instead of talking about a game, I'm going to talk about a conference that we um, organized about games and art. And um, the reason I wanted to share this as opposed to other game um, structures we've actually created for engagement is because I thought it was interesting to really share uh, the context of games within an institution or a museum. An art museum in this case that collects objects and um, looks at games in multiple ways. So um, last May uh, we organized a two-day conference called Critical Play, The Game is an Art Form, and actually Pedro was part of that conference as well. And um, Really, what the conference looked at was um, how games as an experience, how that influenced artistic practice, and how artists are using games as a platform or as a framework um, to create uh, projects or artworks that um, encourage or demand engagement in some way. Um, and the, the conference um, covered some really interesting key topics. The first thing that I, I think is really important was our, our keynote presentation was about the history of artists and games. And so looking at um, the narrative that exists between the way artists, between artists and games and the way artists used games in a variety of ways starting at the beginning of the 20th century, um, both to um, help um, work collaboratively with other artists, to um, brainstorm and come up with new ideas and develop their own sense of creativity, to things that are starting to happen now with artists like Pedro and even um, the project that Eric was talking about where artists are really um, using games um, as their medium in a lot of ways. Um, the other topics we explored were uh, violence in games. Um, we looked at social practice in games, which I think will probably come up a little later in this conversation. We looked at games and literacy, and then we looked at games and design. And um, over the course of two days, we had a series of panel discussions focusing on these areas. The conference included um, artists, game designers, theorists, educators, um, and curators from, from the museum. We thought it was really important to have a broad perspective on, on the way games are being dealt with in institutions in a lot of ways. Um, and one of the most important parts of the conference for us, which is really um, a bit of a departure from the way we, we, do, pro um, we do these kinds of programs, um, is we had a two-hour game time. And this was really critical to the experience of the conference and to understanding these larger ideas. Um, 
Pedro um, actually staged some um, some games and interactions from his sanatorium project, which was presented at the Guggenheim um, a few years ago. We also had um, games like um, Biophilia, which uh, is a collaboration between Bjork and uh, Scott Snibby. Um, so we're not even we're talking about a musician and a designer, um, and what they did together created a really beautiful aesthetic experience that we really felt was important to include in kind of the, the narrative that, that is going on right now in, in the world of making. Um, generally speaking, the conference, um, in terms of expectations and, and our audience, um, number one, we had lots of people um, coming to the museum that um, for this event that had never come here before. And I think it was really important for us because MoMA has been engaged with games and engagement and participatory practices via our education department um, for more than just the last year. Um, but I think uh, with the museum now collecting games as part of our collection, um, this conference really brought together the way games are being employed both as objects with aesthetic value, but also as um, frameworks for participation and audience engagement. Great. Thanks, Sheetal. That is fantastic. Shane, I was wondering if you wanted to uh, respond to some of these projects and ideas. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you all for sharing um, the projects. Really exciting conversations and stuff going on. Um, I wanted to first talk about this idea that Ted and I have been um, bouncing around that the public um, no longer is content to be a consumer in the way that we used to think of consumers and that the public now wants to be a producer, um, to constantly be managing content for a customized experience that they're actively involved in producing, right? So in both Eric and Pedro's examples, um, there's this built-in adapt an adaptability to the projects. Um, with Eric, I'm interested in the object itself being a kind of field that a variety of games could be developed to be played on top of. Um, and in Pedro's, this idea of taking these old parlor games or street games and re-adapting them for a contemporary use. Um, so when we're thinking about activating space with bodies and materials, um, something that I really wanted to ask Pedro specifically was what does the field of the museum provide for these these games for these activities and how do you assess their success or failure inside the museum um, well that's a very interesting question because uh, whenever you have a participation project uh, I believe that it's important to have certain measure certain ways to measure uh, if the if particip participation is 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 effectively ha effectively happening, so um, for me the way that you like to see how the we were making a print run of a thousand posters for each game, and depending on how the posters were. You know, there was only like a, a person that was like overseeing that people not taking the posters for free unless they play a game. So we could see how uh, many games were played by subtracting the names, the numbers of, of, of posters that were left. No? Uh, and, but in a way, you know, the idea was to somehow uh, underline that. The, these games are part of the commons. You know, they they appear in many cultures under different names and with certain variations. But the beauty is that no one can own them, and that no one can profit from them. Uh, which is something that is rare today because there's an increasing capitalization of or or, or like a. a of, of leisure or leisure time and leisure space so so in in that sense I believe that the museum's role is interesting in somehow uh, presenting a framework for 
introducing these games, but that the museum won't own them in, in, in like uh, they can own perhaps just like a fetish or a um, memorabilia of of these activities, but the activities uh, belong to the commons. So when you say participation, do you assume when people are playing the games, is there an assumption that they're engaged? Is it does it follow that if you play a game, you're necessarily engaged, or or can you be just participating without engagement? Uh, I mean, it's. I mean, for instance, if you're in a pillow fight, I don't know how you can be participating without like engaging in the and hitting and being hit. Uh, it's very it's very straightforward. I mean, the 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 engagement is very. Uh, how to say? On yeah, like bodily almost. Uh, be, because it's. It, because it's bodily, it's a because it's enacted physically. The experience. Could Eric speak to that in his game interface about this question of engagement versus participation? Uh, sure, Shane. I I actually think um, it goes back to some of Ted's points in in the opening remarks that that he shared with us that have to do with um, the difference between a uh, a player or gamer and an ardor participant. I actually think that whenever you have a moment of culture, you have a sort of ecosystem of people playing different roles. And in any given game, we often talk about people that might do a kind of browse by interactivity. They might want to try it out a little bit. Um, people that have a more dedicated relationship to it and might play it for a while. And other people that might want to hang back as spectators. And within, and, and within this kind of set of different roles and relationships to the game, there's sort of an ecosystem that happens. I was uh, just having a conversation a couple days ago with a curator friend of mine, Carol Stacanis, who's in Los Angeles, and she was talking about the way she approaches her ecosystem of visitors to her space, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, which um, she talked about streakers, people that kind of run through really fast, strollers, people that kind of take their time, meander through and leave, and scholars who might be more um, visiting on a professional level and have a different set of expectations and a different way of relating to the artworks. Um, so I, I think that wherever you look in culture, people have a different sort of set of relationships that becomes a sort of social ecosystem around the, the artwork or game or cultural experience. But I, that said, I do agree with, with what Shane said about this being a time in which participation with our media, with our art, entertainment, and leisure is a model for how people interact with culture these days. So that, for example, people no longer research by accessing a set of experts in an encyclopedia. Instead, they are more likely to go to something like Wikipedia, um, which is a place where the boundaries between producers and consumers are blurred. And it's a kind of a messy human ecosystem of information being generated, edited, critiqued, deleted, um, added to, rather than a kind of simple producer-consumer relationship. So I think that on the one hand, forms of culture all have this sense of participation, but, but the times in which we're living, and games in particular, really do highlight participation. Do you, when you're working for a museum context, um, do you build in this customization factor, this idea that the public wants um, an experience to be about themselves, their friends, their circle, their influences, etc.? Um, I think it depends on the work. Uh, museum interaction is generally pretty small. For example, even playing a casual video game, you might sit and go through tutorial, play several levels, return to it over a few days, um, or a week or two, and that might end up being, um, you know, an hour, five hours, ten hours of playtime. In a museum, you're probably talking about a much smaller amount of time, five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, occasionally people might stay longer. So as a designer, um, creating works for a classic museum context, it's, it's a lighter form of interaction. You have to take, you have to take that into, a, into account. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, there are games that can be all about player expression.
question and wanting to see people. I actually don't think games are better or worse because they're more or less flexible for players. They're just different kinds of games. Yeah, I was going to add that I that um, I had an opportunity last year to be involved in an exhibition that utilized games down at Haverford College where, where they actually sort of, instead of devising new games, simply imported existing games, and in this case it was a game, the game Ski Ball, which I think most people are sort of familiar with as sort of a popular boardwalk game, right? But that basically the idea was actually to not have an innovative game at all in the gallery, but to actually have a very well-known game in the gallery, but to involve the entire Haverford campus in a way um, quite directly. And it was, just, it was a very interesting experience. I mean, the structure the curators came up with was that all the staff, they wanted to kind of illustrate the campus through a known game so that they made a tournament that every single student, staff, and faculty was automatically entered in. And actually the results of that tournament were the content on the wall and they were sort of constantly being filled in. So your status as a gamer, as a winner, as a loser was actually something that became public through the, through the process of, of game playing. It was, actually, it was a super interesting um, adaptation of some of these ideas into kind of more like a critical gallery context. But one that I thought that kind of turned it a little bit on its head because it was really actually about doing something that people were very familiar with, you know, rather I, than doing... Go ahead. I, I, think, I think one of the interesting things, again, going back to your opening remarks, is that although games are ancient, we know that there are games that are, you know, at least 10,000 years old, um, until really the 20th century, games were more or less folk culture. So the yeah. parlor games and sports and, and other kinds of games that people played were not authored works of culture the way that, you know, at least since the Renaissance and earlier than that, you know, people that painting and sculpture and, and, and other kinds of, of forms of art had become authored works. So I think what's interesting now is that we're living in a time where games are sort of figuring this out. So there's, there's still something of great value, I think, in the folk games approach of the exhibition that you're talking about and in the, that, that Pedro works. At the same time, there are people that want to invent new forms of play. Um, and for me, the museum becomes a space of cultural research um, that has... Eric, I'm afraid we've we've lost you for the moment. Um, we'd love for you to finish that thought when you come back to us. And are you there, Eric? Frozen. Eric, we I'm can't sorry, hear I you. I off momentarily. I apologize. Yeah. So we kind of lost that last little bit of you were talking about. You were talking about how some people want to invent new forms of play. Right. So there's. Yeah, so I just think that games exist in a wonderfully interesting cultural space between folk culture and authored culture. And for me, the museum is a space of doing cultural research where you can um, uh, experiment in ways that aren't necessarily possible in the commercial game world. Great. Shane, I thought you had another question. I, I wanted to bring Sheetal into this um conversation and to hear about um, the museum's perspective on bringing games in and how you assess viewer engagement um, when people are coming into the museums to basically play in a structured way. Sure. Um, well, I think just to, just to be really clear, I think that museums are dealing with games in two separate ways, and I'll talk about one of them. Um, I think one is from a collection standpoint, which I'm not going to talk about very much, and like, you know, the aesthetics of games and treating games as objects. I think that's one thing. I'm going to talk more about engagement in games um, in museums. And I think for museums, um, games are um, a very ideal framework for eliciting engagement. And for, for us, I think, in a lot of ways, games are that conduit between the content and the experience. Um, they're, they're, I think a lot of what we try to do in museums, especially in education departments, is to, to bridge that gap. How do we make the content compelling? How do we make the content relevant? How do we make the content mean something? And games are a way to help people um, 
have some kind of agency in the process of learning and to discover things on their own through this framework of play. And I think it's important to remember for, for institutions at least that play has always been a big part of our educative practice, um, especially with young people, children and families. And I think in the last 30 to 40 years, we've seen a shift in the larger educational world that museums have really kind of grabbed onto um, with the recognition that, you know, learners um, of all ages, um, they can have similarities between the way that they understand information. So a 10-year-old and a 70-year-old might have the same approach to understanding something. And games for us are a way to kind of bring those things together. Um, I think in terms of engagement and this idea of player versus participant, for us, participation happens in a large spectrum, and I think Eric touched on this a little bit, um, as did Ted. Um, for us, passive um, or inactive participation is just as important in, in, in within the framework of an institution as very active participation. So um, games provide uh, kind of that whole range. Um, as Eric mentioned, um, in the project that he was talking about, um, who's talking about the observers of the people playing his actual game. And for us, that's equally as important as the people playing the game. So I think for art institutions and just in general, um, we games are often a framework for us. They're a platform for engagement and, and one of the many ways that we engage our audiences with the content that we have to offer. Both, uh, sorry, one more thing. Both with, with the institution but also with our other visitors. Um, which is uh, kind of hard to do sometimes um, when all of our content is on the walls. Um, but games allow people to interact with each other um, and learn together, which I think is also a very important part of why they've become um, so prevalent in institutions in a way that they were not before. Great. Thanks, Sheetal and Shane and Eric and Ted and Pedro. Um, it looks like we have time just for one kind of last question, and I want to go back to this um, piece of writing that Ted referenced earlier today by Zach Gage um, at, called Let's Talk About Play that was delivered this past March at the Resonate Conference. Um, and I just, I'm just going to read a little bit of actually a little bit of his um, presentation to frame a question. Um, play is a funny word to skip for participatory art, but it's one that I can understand why it might be skipped. When I look around for examples of people talking about play in art, it's always about children. There's this false idea that adults don't play or shouldn't play, that play can't explore truly sublime ideas. But adults play all the time. Adults play video games, they play in negotiations, they play at work. The idea that play is something to be avoided is that in artistic discussion is insane to me. This is Zach's words. Um, to be presumptuous, I think play is a poisonous word in the stark vocabulary of the Art Academy. Play is considered dumb. Play is a considered a lowly form of engagement. So my last question to the folks here today and you know, to our viewers at large is this, um, I guess, the relationship that, that we have to play. I mean, we are all in some form or another um, engaged in a form of play in our practices. But I think um, from my personal experience, often personal experiences, oftentimes there's, it can be challenging to engage people or get people of, into a comfort zone in which they can play. So I wonder if, if all or any or all of you might want to comment on some takeaways for our viewers who might be makers of games or artists in public practices about things that you've learned in working in the kind of public field of institutional participation in games um, with regards to helping people kind of access a, their own form of play. Um, well, if I can comment on that, Nancy, I think that uh, that the, uh, somehow the idea of play has been uh, also brought into attention lately, perhaps under the frame of Frederick Schiller, uh, no, when he, in the aesthetic education of man, uh, says that a man is only free when he plays 
and on, it's only uh, so you know like the relationship between freedom and 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 play no uh, but i think that there may be something a little bit more specific that is spont that is spontaneity no that you know how do you uh, uh, what is the relationship be between spontaneity and creativity? You know, how, like, you have to somehow have a rehearsal space, a safe, a safe space where you can do mistakes and pull around because only if you have that uh, field where you can uh, mess around and, 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 and be foolish and uh, test different things and rehe do rehearsals, then you arrive to discoveries um, so I think that that one of the important issues of, of play is is that, that that relationship between spontaneity and creativity. And uh, I also believe that that in serious fun, no, uh, mm -hmm. the idea of serious fun, which means that uh, well, that we are all nerds who you know like find. A uh, number of uh, serious subjects. Quite, uh, we found these serious subjects quite amusing, and that's the way we 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 have fun. No, so so serious fun is also a uh, 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 way to put it. Uh, I, I I'm sure that all of you may have uh, other things to comment on this. I actually think um, going back to what. What Shane was talking about, I would say if the 20th century was a century in which information and really the moving image was a dominant form of culture, um, I mean, a lot happened in the 20th century, but, but I would say that the, the predominant way that people told stories, got their news, the way that epic narratives were constructed was through the moving image, film and video, I would be so bold to say that we're now in a century of play, or what I, I like to call the ludic century. So while Zach Gage is right that play is often devalued, and Brian Sutton Smith writes about this wonderfully in The Ambiguity of Play, I also think that things are shifting and that we're living in a time in which more and more of our art, entertainment, uh, media, research, work, communication, socialization, romance, flirting uh, are really predicated on play and interacting with um, networks of information and digital systems in which we're not just getting that information, but we're, we're, we're playing with them. Now, um, so I think that while Zach may be right, I think that in the future, play is going to become less of a dirty word and become more integrated into our practice on a daily basis. Maybe we'll call it something else. Um, I do think also that, uh, to agree with Pedro, play is about innovation and creativity in the sense that when we play with a structure, we are finding the ways of interacting with it that aren't the ordinary normal ways. For example, slang is a playful way to use language. Um, and slang is sort of playing in language that eventually transforms the language. And so what previously was slang becomes an actual word in a dictionary, whereas new forms of language emerge at the margins to, to enter into the center. So I think that play is not necessarily just about playing in games, but a whole way of thinking about the way structures transform, cultural structures, for example, interpersonal structures, psychological structures, and the, the potential of using play in an institutional context like a museum is trying to see how we can engage with some of those structures, whether they are physical, architectural structures, whether they are, are social, psychological structures, whether they are cultural, um, structures and play with them and see how we can twist and bend them and do something new with them and transform them in new ways. And, and to me, that's what's so exciting about, about working in games and play. I would jump in um, at this point, too, because I think, I think I, is my, my microphone on? Is it working? OK, good. Um, Given all that, and I think I, 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 there's a lot that resonates with me with what Eric and Pedro just said, though I think that though, so one of the things that's at stake is that there's going to have to be a fairly large rethink because once you sort of get into these zones of play, some of the lines of authority and, and sort of creative production start to slip away, which, which, you know, whether you're thinking about museums or the movie industry or even the notion of, of, of 
of a single point author, you know, I, I think what Eric said earlier is, is, it, is an interesting thing, that the history of games is, one, is not one of authorship, right, until, until fairly recently. And we've evolved a, a fairly complex world that actually is very interested in authorship. So I think that's one of the, one of the, the sort of paradigm shifts that this sort of, if there is a century of play, that that's going to sort of push forward here is how do we actually think about authorship. Um, I was thinking about this pretty specifically about, about two months ago. I went to um, a gaming convention over the weekend, which was all about miniature gaming. And had a really interesting conversation with a young guy who was there who was, you know, like many, many people there was a gamer, but he was also a guy who went to art school and was trained as a sculptor. And there he was, you know, instead of sort of pursuing his sculpture um, and sort of getting jobs in galleries and things like that, he basically had been making miniatures which were being reproduced, which were going to be used by gamers, right? Um, and they were going to be used however people use them, right? They're going to be cut up, they're going to be painted, they're going to be changed, they're going to be introduced into people's games in, in their own way that they want to be introduced in. And that's a very different model, I think, of not just authorship and authority, but just in terms of structure, in terms of even how people sort of think about their own creativity. And I think to me that's sort of what's at stake here, um, if, if I can rely on that one anecdote, perhaps, to sort of illustrate it. Um, well, I just wanted to jump in, and I just wanted to make a couple of comments from um, what Eric said, but also what Ted said. So first, um, Ted's point about authorship. I mean, I think this is a huge reason that institutions have embraced games in such a, a wonderful way. Um, there is, besides kind of this like deconstruction of authorship within institutions, there's also a, a parallel thing going on where peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning has become such a big part of our experience, right, in the, in the digital world. Um, as Eric was saying, you know, people are going to Wikipedia and it totally turns authorship and, and upside down. And I think for, for us in museums, um, we're really interested in, in giving people that kind of agency. And I think play allows that to happen. I think Eric's point about uh, play being a way to um, work with things in, in, unexpected, in unexpected ways is really, really important because I think people come to museums, a lot of the, the uh, tension that we have is uh, people come here and they don't really know what's going on. They don't know a lot about the art that they're seeing on the walls and I think play allows them um, to find a space that um, is not intimidating, quite frankly. And a lot of people are in that same boat and I think adults especially are very apprehensive a lot of times to admit that and um, games and play allow places like museums to say to people and to provide an environment that's about an even playing field which is really really important when you come to a place where you want to have fun and you want to enjoy yourself so I think those are kind of simple ideas but they're really really important um, to institutions because we're trying to change the culture that we provide for other people and um, that's that's a hundred years of history that we're kind of contending with more than a hundred years so I think that's where that connection takes place and the other thing that I just wanted to talk about was this notion of exchange and why games are so great for that um, you know a lot of our learning process is cumulative you build on knowledge that you've had before and then you come to a new understanding and I think um, Games allow people to exchange with each other, with the framework that they're playing within, and in within institutions with the actual organizations and the people that are around them. So I think exchange is a really big part of, of why institutions are kind of latching on to games as a framework for learning and engagement. I, I just want to say one really tiny thing, which is that um, I think Ted and Cheeto, when you talk about what happens with the institutions, the exciting thing for me is that play can be dangerous. Um, yeah. I was just at a friend's house playing with her cat uh, uh, last week, and uh, I don't want to show you, but my, my hands and forearm are covered with scratches because sometimes play leaves its mark and it can be dangerous and, and change things and kind of hurt things. And I think that to really embrace play, something about the institution might get changed and transformed in a way that won't always be uh, pleasant for the institution, but that's, again, the exciting thing. So I'm, I, I think embracing dangerous play is also. That's great. I, 
I am somewhat skeptical that the institution is truly embracing play. I, I see how the institution embraces game because games have rules. But um, when Pedro starts to talk about the relationship between freedom and play, I, I think he's really onto something important about this issue of spontaneity um, and of games belonging to the that play, um, that there's a, a possibility, and I ask this as a question to the group, that the play can't truly be co-opted, but the games perhaps can be. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I wonder if that, if we're making um, not enough of a distinction between when play becomes game and what happens when that shift occurs. Wow, that's a, that's a fantastic kind of question to leave us with, Shane. I'm so sorry that we are out of time. Um, I think that's, that's a really kind of wonderful takeaway for all of us to go away and think about. Um, for those of you who sent in questions that we didn't get to, we'll send some answers on email. Um, again, I'm so sorry we're out of time, but this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much to all of our participants, Eric Zimmerman, Pedro Reyes, Shane Aslan Selzer, Shito Prajapati, and Ted Pervez. Um, it's been an honor to share this panel with you. Thank you all for joining us at Playtime. And for everyone out there watching, join us for the next episode of Playtime Online, Wednesday, June 19th, for the Ultimate Sandbox Share Off. Um, tune in to hear from students, parents, and educators as they discuss how they use Minecraft, everyone's favorite, as a learning tool. Uh, for anyone who wants updates on Playtime, sign up for our mailing list. Just click Join Us uh, at the top of the page. And again, everyone, thanks for watching. If you like what you're doing, please spread the word.